ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Welcome everybody to the Safina Society. Nothing but facts live stream. Where today is Wednesday, and you know what that means? That means we are on the dua of Dar al Fatih, of um, Wednesday between Dhuhr and Asr. So we begin with Hizb al Nasr, and then after Hizb al Nasr, we will have a dua. And then after that, we will go to segment number two, which is um, events of the Ummah. And we have with us Ismail Khatib, who is a political scientist and Talib Ilm, and a uh, marketing entrepreneur. When What's your day job? IT specialist? Project management. Okay. And he has his own business. So, so he'll be with us, help uh, digging up. You'll be digging up with us, inshallah, uh, issues to, to discuss. You got your phone on you? Okay, good, good. All right, let's begin with our dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina liaghfira laka Allahu ma taqaddama min dhanbika wa ma taakhar wa yutimma ni'matahu alayka wa yahdiyaka siratam mustaqima. وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا وكان عند الله وجيها وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين وجهت وجهي للذي فطر السماوات والأرض بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نصر من الله وفتح قريب ومبشر المؤمنين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لا رأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم أعيذ نفسي بالله تعالى من كل ما يسمع بأذنين ويبصر بعينين ويمشي برجلين ويبطش بيدين ويتكلم بشفتين حصنت نفسي بالله الخالق الأكبر من شر ما أخاف وأحذر من الجن والإنس وأن يحضر نعز جاره وجل ثناؤه وتقدست أسماؤه ولا إله غيره اللهم إني أجعلك في نحور آدائي وأعوذ بك من شرورهم وتحيلهم ومكرهم ومكائدهم أطفئ نار من أراد بعداوة من الجن والإنس يا حافظ يا حفيظ يا كافي يا محيط سبحانك يا رب ما أعظم شأنك وعز سلطانك تحسنت بالله وبأسماء الله وبآيات الله وملائكة الله وأنبياء الله ورسول الله والصالحين من عباد الله حصنت نفسي بلا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم احرسني بعينك التي لا تنام وكنفني بكنفك الذي لا يرام وارحمني بقدرتك علي فلا أهلك وانت الثقتي ورجائي يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث المستغيثين يا درك الهالكين يا درك الهالكين يا درك الهالكين اكفني شرك لي طارقا يطرق بليل أو نهار إلا طارقا يطرق بخير إنك على كل شيء قدير بسم الله أرقي نفسي من كل ما يؤذي ومن كل حاسد الله شفاء بسم الله رقيد اللهم رب الناس أذهب الباس اشفي أنت الشافي وعافي أنت المعافي لا شفاء إلا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر السقم ولا ألم يا كافي يا وافي يا حميد يا مجيد ارفع عنا كل تعب شديد وكفنا من الحد والحديد والمرض الشديد والجيش العديد واجعل لنا نورا من نورك وعزا من عزك ونصرا من نصرك وبهاء من بهائك وعطاء من عطائك وحراسة من حراستك وتأييد من تأييدك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام والمواهب العظام أسألك أن تكفينا من شر كل ذي شر إنك أنت الله الخالق الأكبر 
وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والحمد لله رب العالمين ظاهرا وباطنا وعلى كل حال يا أرحم الراحمين الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I just want to open up with um, something I was thinking about the other day and how it sounds very simple but it's actually really amazing and just a fact سبحان الله that thinking about death to me right is to me was one of the greatest creations that we have. Is you got good things happen, you have bad things happen. If good things happen, you say, Alhamdulillah, I get to live, right? It's a big nama to be alive and to go for it, okay? And when bad things happen, it actually becomes very easy to just brush them off the more you think about death. And thinking about death is to me, it's a meditation, it's a meditation that relates to a const, a, a, someone who's consistently done this and creating this feeling in yourself that you're leaving, which first, it may be true. You just literally never know when you're going to, you don't know when you're going to die. But one of the ways I like to look at it is everyone experiences the night before a journey, right? The night before you travel. There's a feeling there. You close up, you tell everyone I'm leaving. So and so, you got the keys to the house, feed the cats. There's a certain vibe and a certain feeling when you're leaving. And that's the type of feeling you recreate for yourself. And so it's the hardships of life become something that you easily push off, right? Or everyone knows the feeling of being in transit. Nobody in transit needs to sit there, is ever going to get upset sitting there looking around. I don't like the architecture of this airport, right? Any more than just one second. You're not going to spend more than a second saying, man, this airport needs to be. Every airport I walk into, I have a comment, right? You walk into the new Turkish airport, like, wow, there's a nice airport. That's it. No more, right? <laughs> Nobody takes pictures. You walk into the new wing of JFK. Wait, was it JFK? They, new, uh, they got a new wing, right? Okay, so that new terminal. And you're like, oh, wow, well, that's much improved. You walk, so that's it. That's the max. You don't spend more than just a sliver of a moment observing the airport. But who cares after that, right? You get onto a United flight or an American Airlines flight or a Delta flight, these American... The one thing that the Americans are so... Like, they're like last place in is their airlines because they're all for-profit airlines 
were at private. Whereas all these other countries, they're all government backed, like Emirates, Singapore. They go on, it's like luxury, right? It's a luxury experience. The food's actually good, everything's good. They over uh, feed you. We got off of one of these airlines, and people like, you know, when they're on a plane, they get like, they get bored and they just keep eating, right? And these people will just stuff you. And I remember everybody who got off the, the recent flight from JFK to uh, Dubai. And we get off the Emirates flight. All of us are holding our stomachs. Man, they just gave us way too much food. So, But you go on to one of these American United Delta flights and you feel like, okay, whatever. It's just four hours. Let me get off this, this darn flight. Nobody, you'll never think of it again, right? If you could actually brainwash yourself, wallahi, this is the best skill. It's probably a better skill, I would say, than making money. You can make a lot of money and be miserable in your life. And you could make, um, but, but you can't possibly learn the skill of, in a sense, molding your mood and never be miserable. Like it's, it'll take a lot for you to be miserable if you learn how to mold your mood. And the greatest gift that the prophets come and tell us is that this is an abode of good, bad, and the ugly and everything else. And it's short. And you're going to pass by it like this then you go to a, a permanent place. This is the place of permanence. And the, the concept is that this is not our home. This is the home of animals, jaguars, cats. Throw a cat in the street. Throw a human in the street, right? Throw a human with no clothes in the street and no, one, no one's allowed to help him. And throw a cat and a mouse and a cockroach. Which, which of the four will survive? All three except the human, Right? The human, he has to cook his food, right? He needs other humans to help him out. None of these other animals need that. This is their home. This is their abode. And people say, why can't, you know, I want to take my dog to paradise. You know, that's like a thing, right? Everyone says, I want to take my cat to paradise. All right, you say, that, you say yes, right? <laughs> but when you get there, it's not going to work for you or them. Your cat, of course, Allah can create anything in paradise, but the cat is made to live here. That's why it doesn't need anything. It doesn't need its food to be cooked. It doesn't need a jacket. It doesn't need a house. It doesn't need anything. This is not our abode. We need to strive for resources. We need roofs. We need to huddle up together because we can't survive. We need all these things. And we're never always happy. Cats never have depression. Dogs never have depression until they live with humans who give them the depression, right? That's why there are depressed dogs because they live with depressed humans. Like the vibes, almost by osmosis in the air, your depression has come upon the dog, right? All these things happen to animals because of us. But for us, all these terrible things are bound to happen at some point or other. So we, what the prophets come and say, when it's good, enjoy it. When it's bad, have this toolkit in your head, in your hand. Learn this toolkit of how to shut your eyes and affect yourself. And we affect ourselves with the truth. We don't affect, that's the difference between Islam and all these other meditations. All these other meditations, you're just fooling yourself, right? It's empty. There's no guarantee. But that, and that's why the smart people say, this is all nonsense. Nothing matters except the dollar, right? In, in that world. And a guy like Marx, he's right. When he assesses all these other religions, it's nonsense. It's, an, it's a drug. He's right when they're false religions right but when you have the truth and you're when you have proof of the sitq of this god and prophet and book and you have an ummah of a billion people if you're worried hey did i get this right well don't worry a quarter of the world agrees on this right and some people they need that consent that that uh like uh, social proof that's what it is social proof Talk about social proof, like a company puts up all their social media people saying how great their company is, right? That's social proof. Reviews. What about, there's, there's only one organization, one idea, one movement, one thing that its headquarters has no less, the two cities, two sacred cities, no less than half a million people at any given moment of the year. At any given moment, there's no less. Yeah, 250,000 is probably the least 
of people that are ever between Mecca and Medina, like at either city. So I would say half a million. There's never less than half a million people. Does anyone else have that? Right? Anybody have, have, have anything like that? The, the Vatican. You know, people say, oh, look at these, look at these Catholics. Look at their guards. All perfect. Their helicopters. The, everything is perfect with the Catholics. There's no people there. That's why. Give, us, give them 10,000 people doing Umrah. They'll destroy the place, right? <laughs> that Vatican will be, they're like, oh, how pristine it is. Yeah, because there are no people, right? Give, give, give them a million people. Let's get a, a, a pilgrimage to the Vatican, not to hate on, on Catholics. I always say the Catholics, they have, we have some alliances, right? But as a religion, they're the only other religion out there, right? D worthy of discussing. The Protestants aren't worthy of discussing. There's too many different groups. The Catholics are like one, you can see what they study and everything. They have one theology. So we could talk about them. All right, let's give them. Let's give them 10,000 Nigerians, 10,000 Indonesians, 10,000 Malaysians, 10,000 Bengalis. Go, you'll be praying, right? Give them 10,000 Egyptians, okay? I wanted to have some mercy on them, that's why. <laughs> give them all that, okay? And go deal with yourselves now. It's going to be chaos, but you come. So don't look at those places. Look at the beauty and the energy that is present in, in these two holy sacred cities. And the kids come back, okay? The kids come back. They, they don't have a doubt, right? And they don't know why they don't have a doubt. They, they are on. Why, do they, why are they on? Because number one, they felt something on the inside that was so deep, nothing can rival it. That's number one. Number two, they saw the social proof, whether they realize it or not. They saw the proof because so, that is a proof. If something is true, then why aren't a lot of people admitting to it? Right? And we say the foundations of our religion are self-evident truths. Okay. They, you, if it's self-evident, as you claim, why, there should be millions of people. Well, here are the millions. Right? SubhanAllah. So that's something I wanted to always... I think everyone ha can benefit from this skill. Anytime that you feel yourself like really crummy and really miserable, no worries. Turn it on. That Why should I be upset? I'm going somewhere amazing. And it could be soon. It could be a little bit later. It doesn't matter. The Prophet said, Kullu atin qareeb. Everything that's guaranteed is actually is near. Right? You should treat it as being something near. All right. With that little opening monologue, Let's go to the news for today. Um, why don't you look up uh, what Five Pillars has? Meanwhile, I'll read the first news out of Philadelphia. This has nothing to do with Islam, but sort of does because it is a Russian Orthodox defenseman for the Philadelphia Flyer hockey team. Ivan Provorov did not make the pregame skate Tuesday night because he refused to wear the team's LGBTQ plus Pride Night warm-up jersey, okay? Citing his religious beliefs. Provorov, 26, told reporters, after the Flyers' 5-2 home win over the Anaheim Ducks, that it was his choice to stay true to myself and my religion. What I'd like to point to is what kind of language did he use, how the Philadelphia Flyer organization treated him, or treated this situation, and how the media is treating him. Okay, So he said, uh, I chose to, to stay true to myself and my religion. Is that not some really good um, public relations um, line? Obviously his agent must have fed it to him. There's no 26-year-old. That is some great language. Who's going to say, who's going to say that that's bad? Right? And aren't you all about choice and being true to yourselves? So why not the Russian Orthodox guy being true to himself? I respect everyone. I respect everyone's choices. Okay? We, we don't have a problem saying that in the sense of, I respect you. I'm not going to cut you off on the street. I'm not going to cut you off at the supermarket. I respect you. And that's your choice. You have the choice to... Um, uh, you have the choice to, uh, uh, to exercise your free will. Right? Before the game, the Flyers wore pride-themed jerseys and used sticks wrapped in rainbow tape. That's, that's too much. Jeez. 
like it's too, it's it's just uh you guys are really insecure about your future that's why you have to push 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 for the grain flyers they they did this and they're now being auctioned off by flyers charities with proceeds going to the efforts to grow the game in diverse communities okay provorov was the only flyer player who didn't have a jersey or a stick up for auction after the game. The Flyers released a following uh, press release. The Philadelphia Flyers organization is committed to inclusivity and is proud to support Komenuts. Many of our players are active in their support of Komenuts. And we were proud to host Pride Night again this year. The Flyers will continue to be strong advocates for Komenuts. The NHL, in response to ESPN's request for comment, stated, players are free to decide which initiative to support. That's a big step in rights <laughs> for those who aren't supporting Komodils. Like, why should I support them? Okay. Hockey is for Everyone is the umbrella initiative under which the league encourages clubs to celebrate the diversity that exists. Hold on a second. You guys have a lot of medchalis. Have you tapped into the medchali market in Philadelphia? Right? You got a big time Germantown, Sedefi. So for that warm up, I want you, the players, to wear big beards. Okay? And I want them to lift their pads up above the ankles. Okay? And do that for the warm up. All right? And um, and while uh, they're warming up, play Othaymin Khutbah instead of music in the warm-up so that you could be inclusive of the massive Salafi community in Philadelphia, right? Am I wrong about that? I mean, aren't they buyers? They, they, they buy stuff. They'll, they'll buy your tickets. It's halal for them to come to the games. And players will decide uh, whom to celebrate, when, and how. Right, the, the the club can decide that, and the player can decide what to be part of, right? But I mean, they're inclusive for all fans. The Sadafi fan, of, you know, Sadafi Philly is, Philly is nudged basically. <laughs> okay, so why not so include them? If I'm a Sadafi, I'll let you figure that out by doing some Google search and doing watching a couple. Uh, yeah, listen to the live stream a little bit. Okay. I was about to make a joke huh? Imam Malik is from the Salaf. He is Abu Hanif. Huh? Abu Hassan Ashari is from the Salaf. Imam Malik is from the Salaf. These are um, from the first generations of Islam. There's no madhab that is closer to the Sunnah. It is the Sunnah. The Maliki madhab does not have to be close to the Sunnah. That what is what the Sunnah is. Okay, because he's literally in Medina and he's just telling you what, what they're doing. That's all that's going on in the Madiki Method. That's a summary. So that is the Sunnah. If you want to be upon the Salaf, then uh, start learning the Madiki school. And if you, the Kufin school had 10,000 Sahaba there too. So how did they deviate from the Salaf either? So be a Hanafi as well. The Flyers coach, John Tortorella, one of my favorite personalities, said he didn't contemplate scratching Pro Provorov for not taking warm-ups. He's being true to himself and to his religion. Is this the line we're going to use now? Being true to myself and my religion. That's good. Whoever came up with that, that line is good. Uh, this has to do with his belief in his religion. It's one thing I respect about Provi. He's always true to himself. Right? You've known the guy for three months, but that's fine. That's where we're at with that. Tortorella has made headlines before about his stance on pregame protests. In 2016, he said that any of his players who didn't stand for the national anthem can remain sitting for the rest of the game. Because some of the players, when you sit on the bench and the national anthem goes off, you stand up. So he told his U.S. Olympic team players, this is like the U.S. Olympics, uh, the U.S. team for the Olympics in 2016, he told them, if you plan on sitting for the national anthem, stay seated for the rest of the game. Right, And that got everyone riled up. Well, it doesn't make sense to go to the Olympics and not stand for your national anthem. 
it, it makes sense if you're going to do that for a league game, but if you want to do that, right? But to do that for, um, whatchamacallit, for, uh, for the Olympic game, you're, go, you're there for the flag. Does it make any sense? And he reversed his stance, though, after he was shown uh, racial injustice. I would hope that if uh, one of my players wanted to protest during the anthem, he would bring it to me and we would talk about it, tell me his thoughts and what he wanted to do. From there, we would bring it to the team to discuss it, much like it's being discussed in the country. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Pride events are part of the year-round now. Year-round. Why don't you have Pride Day five times a day, like we have Salah five times a day? That's where we're headed, right? Multiple times a day. Forget year-round or one month. That's where they're headed. For more than a decade, the NHL has been increasing its effort to show its year-round support of Kamalut, said Kim Davis. The Flyers have supported Kamalut. Kamalut has a lot of um, money to spend. They don't have kids. They don't play, pay soccer fees. They don't pay tutors. They don't pay extra gas to deliver their kids anywhere. Any, You know how much, how much money I'd have? Right? You know how much money would be in the community? Except one problem. After one generation, you won't have a community. That's the problem. So we are paying all this money and all this time for kids to have a community in the future. They need to market a community. Right? That's what they need to do. They need to, they need to create converts every year. Now, Gritty is their mascot, and he famously took p- place in the Pride Parade. Okay, he's a, he's a fuzzy little thingy. Okay, all right, so <laughs> what do you have? It doesn't go. Oh, does this mic work, by the way? Take this. Try. Keep it next to you, but don't touch it because it's very sensitive. Just put it right in front of you there. All right, a British Muslim aid org working in Afghanistan has rebuff, rebush, rubbished. This is a, this is a verb now. They have rubbished claims. This, is, this was not a verb when I was there. They have rubbished claims that the Afghan authorities are stealing international aid. Okay. And we're doing, and this is a Muslim NGO? Yes, it's a Muslim aid. All right, Lynn O'Donnell, she's anti Taliban, and she's a journalist, and she was expelled last year from Afghanistan. So is this her way of getting back now? Maybe uh, uh, getting back at the government? She said she based it on anonymous sources. Uh, you know, right there, it's. That's a red flag for journalism, including a, f- unless you have other ways to substantiate that, including a former Afghan intelligence and military officer alleged that unknown quantities are stolen by the Taliban. Tens of millions of dollars are flown into Kabul every week by the U.S. and the U.N. for distribution across the country as humanitarian catastrophe grips tighter with winter closing in. I didn't know the U.S. sends money. What's what's in it for them? I'm not sure. Uh, I know the U.S. holds a significant amount of reserves back in Afghanistan. I know that there's mm. a Okay, so for some reason... That is that interesting. So somehow, for some reason, the U.S. is sending aid to Afghanistan. Fair enough. Unless it's coming through private organizations that have been sending aid to Afghanistan. Mm. Okay, maybe that. Maybe it's private organization, not the U.S. government. Sources inside and outside the country say much of the money never reaches those who need it. You'll never be able to substantiate that, um, being that you're, you're locked out of the country. It's not like America. Anyone could come in and snoop around. Instead, they say unknown quantities are stolen by the Taliban and diverted to their own causes. Mm, keeping supporters on side... With handouts of cash and food and funding the private operations of senior leaders. 
But Human Aid and Advocacy has issued a statement saying the claims are false. This is br- there is a broad consensus that corruption has dramatically decreased since the U.S. withdrawal. If anything, guarantees that aid will reach the recipients are at an all-time high. Somebody, one of someone's gaslighting, right? It's like two completely polar opposite ideas here. Gaslighting, for some of you who don't know this, gaslight, gaslighting is it's it comes from an old movie. And the, the, in this movie, a man, he wanted to marry another woman. And he needed some kind of reason to divorce her. So he wanted to render her insane. So he would go to the khadam, the workers, and he would say, listen, anytime that she turns the gas light on, which is the lamps, turn them off. Anytime she turns them off, turn them on. So she'll start thinking she's going crazy. And anytime that, someone's, that she says, who turned off the, the light? Say, not me. So that she, and, and, she, and they kept doing this until she thought she was going crazy. So the idea of gaslighting is to present uh, the world or a situation as being one way that it totally isn't. But to, to act like that's totally normal, right? That's what gaslighting is, basically. And people who go that route in life, they're going to mess their own heads up. They eventually themselves won't be in touch with reality. It's the punishment of that. Um, so someone here is doing that. This is what Trump did the whole campaign, his whole campaign. He 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 knew some. He, that's that's all he does, literally. By the way, yeah. the, uh, the, I just checked the aid that goes from the U.S. to Afghanistan. It's about a billion dollars since 2021 that they've sent, and it's from the, you know the organization USAID. I don't know if you know. USAID, yeah. Why are you? Why is USAID? Uh, what are they paying all their spies and their translators? And always skeptical. Yeah. As an independent NGO working on the ground, day in and day out, human aid and advocacy has substantial experience delivering life-saving programs across the country by distributing food, clothes, shelter, blah blah blah. Drawing on in-depth interviews with 20 experts, stakeholders with current knowledge. So they basically denied it. That's it. There's nothing else that's juicy. Let's hear about the journalists who got kicked out. Last July, authorities in Afghanistan accused the Australian journalist, Lynn O'Donnell, of supporting armed resistance in the nation and falsifying reports of mass violations and sex, sexual slavery by government officials. The comments by Foreign Ministry spokesman Abdul Qahar al Belhi sounds like an author from like uh, ancient times, right? Uh, came after Lynn O'Donnell accused the authorities of detaining her and forcing her to post a series of tweets stating her articles were false. Mr. Belhi said she was informed that she will be able to stay and operate in Afghanistan if she can produce evidence and substantiate her claims. She was assured that in line with journalistic standards, she will not be required to reveal her sources, but only details of victims or other circumstantial evidence that would allow the authorities to prosecute violators of Afghanistan's law. Ms. O'Donnell, when summoned by the relevant authorities to furnish these proofs, lied about her presence in Afghanistan. She was later discovered hiding in Kabul and taken in for questioning. It seems like it's very low-hanging fruit to say, oh, the Taliban are doing sexual violence or whatever. It doesn't mean she's wrong, but it just looks a little bit like a too simplistic, too low-hanging fruit. You know, everyone's going to applaud that article and share it in the West, right? During the questioning, she was given an opportunity to furnish proof, substantiate claims in her reports of sexual slavery and mass killings by government authorities. Okay. Uh, well, by the way, that statement itself, okay, that statement itself, that she was given that chance and she was asked to do that in a polite manner, that's itself is a claim, to be fair. Okay. She stated that she had no proof and offered to rectify the situation by tweeting an apology. Officials told her that it was clear, this is the real story, right? I don't care about that. 
claims of the food getting to people. Who knows if that's true or false, but this is an interesting story. Uh, officials told her at the time that it was clear she, w- she will recant this tweet upon leaving Afghanistan and claim coercion. Okay. However, authorities relented following Ms. O'Donnell's insistence on tweeting an apology given it was her private account. All right, she wants to tweet an apology, fine. After a few hours of questioning, she was released. O'Donnell said in an article for Foreign Policy Magazine, we're going to read that. Could you, do you see it, what I'm reading? Okay, could you check out the Foreign FP Magazine, see if it's, if it's good to read that, if it's worth reading? That she had traveled to Kabul to see how the country had changed since she left a year ago. She wrote, I left Afghanistan today after three days of cat and mouse with Taliban intelligence agents who detained, abused, and threatened me and forced me to issue a barely literate retraction of reports they said had broken their law and offended Afghan culture. If I did not, they said they'd send me to jail. At one point, they surrounded me and demanded I accompany them to prison. Throughout, a man with a gun was never far away. You are really like, I mean... It could be true, to be fair. Yet at the same time, it's just so cliched. You're like 15 years behind. This is so cliched at this point. I'm not saying there could be a 5% chance it's true, right? But far from achieving their goal of intimidating and undermining me, they showed me what I want to find. I went to find their true face. Brutality, arrogance, lack of humanity. Okay. Her, her, her article. Self-righteousness, intolerance, and misogyny. Is there any other uh, adjective that's going to get you up there in the um, uh, TikTok, Twitter, and uh, whatever? Yeah. Typical. Typical. Their incompetence. Uh, There's another one. Uh, uh, And and their utter lack of ability to... By the way, I'm not saying there can't be 5, 10%, 20% of half of this being true. I'm just saying, doesn't it just sound so cliched? Western woman, shocked by the misogyny of Afghan men, right? It's just like, um, way back there was a movie called Not Without My Daughter, which was like the first movie of the Western woman going to the East and being utterly shocked by the males of the East. How long is this cliche going to last in the Western uh, Hemisphere. Okay, Afghanistan and 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 uh, Afghanistan has fallen prey to terrorists who have not and cannot make the transition from fighting, from fight from a fighting force to a governing body. <clears throat> okay, and by the way, I'm not biased to the Taliban because I was I went against them in in what they did with the girls' schools, in that they allowed. They, they misled everyone, if that claim is true, that they announced we're having school on Monday, and then on like Tuesday night, or, or Sunday night, they cancel it. Or it was worse. It was like Sunday night, they announce tomorrow school, good luck everyone, right? Next day, they cancel school. To me, that's incompetence. That corroborates that there is incompetence going on. That means that you're not... Um, there is some major incompetence. There's some cluelessness. There's a lot of bad things going on. But at the same time, I also um, cited the concept and the idea that uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to talk about schools and things, it's not necessarily a country's obligations to provide that. It is a, it's a custom now that all countries provide schools. And I was definitely against all these Westerners talking, Right? And pitching in, it's like offensive. You should be offended. Imagine some people trying to like, uh, imagine like an, another little uh, organization coming, writing reports, telling us how to run our organization. It's like, who are you, first of all? So um, I think we took a fair approach to that. And also, I don't deny that it very well could be that there were people promoting some liberal agendas in the schools that they discovered late. And they wanted to shut it down quickly. In that case, I would have said you would shut down the boys' school and the girls' school. Why would the boys go if that's the case? Right? Why would the boys go to that school? Right? And wouldn't you have checked the curriculums way in advance? So there was some incompetence. Okay. But I was against the, I'm always against when it comes to Afghanistan, the, you could call it the kicking them when they're down. 
right? These people have faced, and they never get any credit for trauma. When England, Russia, and America, they get no rest. Show me one generation of, of, of Afghans, 25 years. Let's say a generation is 40 years. In Sharia, you know that a generation is 40 years? Why? Because Allah says in the Quran, I lived a whole lifetime amongst you. 40 years is a lifetime, right? Your reputation should be set. Give me four. When is 40 years past when they did not have an invading force coming or leaving, right? I'm not just saying the war. I'm saying the invading force is there. But they get no pass for being traumatized, right? And if one of their own goes and does some heinous crime and then goes back and says, hey, listen, I was abused as a child, right? They will get a pass, okay? But So that's why when I get a foreigner coming here and, and, and pontificating and judging, right? So nobody should be judgmental, except if you're a Westerner, particularly a Western woman, with brown dudes, brown guys. Nobody can be judgmental except that when she's judgmental, right, then we have to applaud it. We have to sympathize with her. I'm saying this with the caveat that she, her claims could have some or a lot or a small amount of truth. We don't know that. But the fact that she goes in there, right, and she's pontificating, you went from Australia... You have nothing else in your career. You went to the low-hanging fruit of Afghanistan to be able to say what you want, right? Who's going to go and verify, right? I think also the other... So that's the part that bothers me. Yeah, yeah. The, other critic, the other criticism I have of, of Western journalists is that <laughs> they seem to be largely silent for the 20 years yeah. of the war, right? That's, what, that's another thing I said the, in, that, in that thing. Where were you, okay, when you're talking about how inhumane this is? Taliban so inhumane with all of what they're doing and shutting down the schools. So the U.S. wasn't inhumane when they were bombing the lights out of them, right? Mountain men, wallahi, in the Afghan war, I saw a member of footage. The guy was walking with like a type of gun, like surface-to-air missiles. They're all carrying them. Of course, the surface-to-air missiles, it's fired off the back of a pickup truck, by guys, they don't, they're figuring out how to use it, right? And they're carrying the supplies and they're showing Taliban fighters or whatever fighters, terrorist fighters. The guy's wearing those flip flops with the Zanubas, we call them. Uh, you know, the flip flop, they don't even sell them anywhere, do they? With the two strands, it's a, a, a 10 cent piece of junk that gives your ankle zero support. It's a piece of sponge and a piece of plastic that goes through from your after your big toe and your other toe, and it goes around the side like that. That's what he's wearing at war, right? Those are the people that you blew the, to bits, okay? Uh, on, uh, on a theory, a true conspiracy theory, that's a true conspiracy theory, that cavemen came in, hijacked two airplanes in New York. That 9-11, if you want to talk about a conspiracy theory, the most wild conspiracy theory, that you'll ever hear is that cavemen from Afghanistan did 9-11. That's, that, 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 that's got to be, if there's ever a conspiracy, that's got to be the conspiracy theory, right? And there is Occam's razor, which is probably the simplest thing is most likely to be true, which is you needed an excuse to, to, to go into Afghanistan to get natural resources for free, and you, you just took down your own building. We've done it before. The Lusitania was fake. The Reichstag with Hitler was fake. Uh, the hot what was the one? I think uh, the Disraeli Hotel. What was that? That bombing was fake, right? That uh, they blamed. I, th I can't remember what that story was. They're so this is the oldest thing in the book. Superpower needs an excuse to steal. Iraq, Iraq was fake. So the Occam's Razor says probably the logic, the simplest logic, is gonna be um, the mo most likely to be true. But you're going to go tell me that people who, whose soldiers are wearing flip-flops to war, okay? So you're silent on all that stuff, but this we have to be outraged. So everywhere I went, in the short time I was in Kabul, people told me of their fear, their loss, their disgust, their desperation. Most have no jobs, no money, no hope. 
what I found was a violent peace. People are arbitrarily detained, disappeared, interrogated, beaten, killed. It could be for any reason or no reason. They will never, they, they will ever know. Go report this about Egypt. You'll be one of the people who disappeared, right? You'll be disappeared, as that now is a verb too, apparently. The Taliban are pitting neighbor against neighbor, encouraging people to spy on and report each other. Fear is digging in, and it's here for the long haul. Listen, you might be 100% true, I don't want to hear it from your mouth. You have no moral authority to talk. Don't you get it yet? Seriously, Black Lives Matter, there's one thing that they, I sort of can get it. They want to tell the white liberal to shut up. Just don't talk. Don't even try to support us, right? That I could sort of get it. She added that she would not be returning to Afghanistan as it would be reckless to do so. But she said she would not stop watching or caring. Listen, she may have... Um, and Iqbal Ahmed commenting here, anonymous sources, right? SubhanAllah. Okay, so... That's it. I have, it's the same position I had with the, with the schools shutting down. To me, you tell them it's on, and then you turn it off the next day. That's just ridiculous. You, get all the, you deserve all the criticism you get. You have the intention of shutting out liberal education and um, Western moral ideas from your school. I'm with you 100%. But if that was the case, it, it would apply to boys as well as girls. I don't see why it would apply to girls, not boys. So that made no sense to me. And on top of that, the girls are, the schools are segregated. I'm with that 100% too. I have no problem with segregated schools. Now, if you're going to say we live in a combined society, so kids should learn how to deal with the opposite gender, I understand that too, right? I, like, I can see both sides. Personally speaking, if you gave me a bunch of boys and you told me educate these boys, I can educate them, right? I can give them a, a really good education. They're going to help me run my businesses. They're, that's how they're going to learn. You take, you're going to take theory for three hours. Theory to me means nothing. Reading hour. Read a history book, read a literature book, and discuss it with an expert. You get to do this for an hour to two hours. That's it. Get a math and a science instructor and computers. You get theory for three, four hours. After that, you're going to roll with me, and you're going to learn real life okay that's i think is really valuable but now tell me okay you're not going to get 20 boys to do this with you're going to get 10 boys 10 girls now i got to change everything right i got to change the tone that i talk to them with i got to be polite all of a sudden i can't be as direct all that stuff right and they will learn in a different capacity in a different way than boys i'm going to shortchange the boys guaranteed so but whatever this is just a pedagogical theory that it's is an opinion. Uh, so the, on that point, I'm I, I'm with them. Okay, so that's that's my take with uh, with the Taliban. But I don't want to hear white liberals talking. It just it's 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 done. We're done with that. The whole world is done with that, right? I'm not wrong in saying this. Everyone says this. We're done with you guys coming. And could you please make a career somewhere else in Australia? Go far back where you came from in Australia, and try to make a career. Don't come to some uh, country that nobody can verify what you're saying because you're so far away. That's You know what that's like in our world of Islam. Uh, I come back to, to New Jersey, and I said, I am now the mufti and the sheikh. Oh, really? And I have ijazah. Okay, well, who did you study with? I study with sheikh, Qutb al-Zaman, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. Oh, really? Where is he from? He's deep in the mountains and the deserts that no one could ever find him. So how, how am I supposed to know if you're a fraud or not? I can't contact. Can I contact your sheikh? No, he doesn't have, there's no electricity there. Can, can we go and talk to him? No, he doesn't meet people. So it's a fraud, right? So that's my feeling when I see these organizations coming in here or these, these people going halfway around the world to go make a career. And by the way, it's just that that's the, the impression. Could it be that she's such a genuine person? She just loves these people. Um, at a certain point, could you please love somebody else? Okay. Yes. And the, the, 
at the end of the day, there's there's a lack of nuance, right? Like you can't go in and have. I mean, I'm sure the Taliban is wildly corrupt in their own way, but also at the same time, the U.S. was there for 20 years, allegedly rebuilding the country. Yeah. As soon as you left, you left this government in charge. Yeah. Which lost the country in a matter of three days. Mm -hmm. So you essentially left a completely. Dis I mean, no government should collapse in three days like this. Right? <laughs> no matter what happens. Three no, days. The, the, like there should be some sort of a fight, which did not happen. So you spent 20 years rebuilding a country only to leave essentially a shell of a government, right? And then the three Taliban days. came and took it in three days. So if they didn't, let's say they didn't take it in three days, what kind of government that collapses in three days can provide any sense of public services or anything? Thank you. They can't do it. They can't defend their country. They can't provide public services. They don't have any money. Yeah. So w w what's the point? Even the wildest, like the most corrupt countries in like the Middle East and stuff. I mean, we've seen. Yeah. People... I, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but people rise up and, uh, you know, you have these rebels. Like, if you even take Syria, which yeah. was a largely corrupt government there, n a strong resistance from the from the rebel side, they stood their ground. They still fought back. They didn't mm -hmm. collapse in three days. Yeah. Unfortunately. But So <laughs> but, so what did you but, do? But, you know, the point is, there's, like, for, for Afghanistan, you spent 20 years, you bombed the country, mm -hmm. you leveled it. And then you said, okay, we're going to start from scratch after you've killed a bunch of people. Yeah. You start from scratch, you spend 20 years building. And then nothing. And so when these journalists come in, it's you can. There's a nuance to be had. Even with the Taliban, they're saying, "Oh, the Taliban are not doing a great job." But also, the U.S. held withheld mm -hmm. over a billion or several, a couple billion dollars of reserve funding mm -hmm. that was supposed to go to the Afghan government should the U.S. ever withdraw. Yeah. And because the Taliban r took over, the U.S. decided not to release that money, which is by international law, you know, illegal. Is right. Yeah, yeah. They shouldn't have withheld it. So you're not even giving them the funds that they would need. Yeah. And they say, oh, look, they didn't do a good job. Well, that is so if uh, unless a journalist is going to come and say, hey, yeah, they're not doing a great job on X, Y, Z, but guess what? Also, we, we left them a uh, destroyed country. Uh, and we took all their money. We, you're not mentioning how, any of that. Then why should I take you seriously? Why don't your investigative journalism actually do something useful and tell us how much was stolen? Exactly. You're not going to tell me the U.S. went in there, spent... A ridiculous sum of money, billions of dollars a, a, a month, I'm sure, right? Mm -hmm. And not get anything out of it. That's investigative journalism, right? Go and tell us, right? And see what the CIA does to you when you do this, right? Yes. See how you're going to get shut down. You will get disappeared, as that's what she said, right? You're going to get so disappeared so fast, no one's going to even know who you were. If you go in there and you say, oh, here is the natural gas pipeline that the U.S. has stolen. And here are the documents saying how much money they're making. That's the real journalism right there. Right? So it's, 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 uh, these journalists are basically like a modern day Orientalists. Yeah. Like that's what they are. Yeah. When you, read, when you look at how they write, it's mm -hmm. like an old Orientalist used to write about. That's exactly it. Places when they used to go to yeah. Places. Next news item. Remember Hamline University, the cartoon? I think it's actually important we do these segments because there is, I believe, a way, both logically and by Sharia, to do an analysis. We all come upon news all the time, right? But we need good analysis. Like, what is a Shari way, logical way to do an analysis? Like, um, sort of bashing and slamming this journalist, but nonetheless, she a percentage of what she's saying may be true. Okay. So we so that's an aspect. Now Hamline University gets death threats after letting go the lecturer who showed the prophet images. A US university out in Minnesota, they let this lecturer go after the whole scandal uh, regarding the Prophet Muhammad's paintings that she showed has received death threats, according to the president of the university. Hamline University has been heavily criticized for its decision. No, they're the complete coward way of handling it. They were complete cowards, right? See, part of uh, the, if we're going to say a shara'i way, which is really a logical way of an analyzing a news story, is to split it up in as many parts as possible, right? So, in that case, it was really interesting. We had to split it up in a lot of parts. The conclusion that they're never going to show an image with the painting of the prophet is wonderful. The way in which they went about it, Hamline University, to me, treated it in a cowardly way. 
week. Uh, the student, the intention, and the way. The intention, fine. I know it's Ahlan. This is our Muslim sister. The intention that she's so upset that the Prophet was shown. I know it's Ahlan. I'm all for that. But the way in which he did it was way off. Far from the right way to do things. The lady, the professor, gave you a chance to talk. Well in advance. Two times. Nobody talked. Right? Nobody talked. You went above her and around her, okay, to rat her out. That's just, not, that is Weasley stuff. That's totally Weasley. And the school who accepted the student to come is as Weasley as her, right? That is as Weasley in action as anybody else. Because now if someone comes to me and says, hey, uh, Ryan doesn't answer my emails, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to say, all right, have you talked to him? Like, have you had a discussion with him? No, I didn't. I don't like the way he talks to me. Okay, can you talk to him about that? No, no, I don't want to do that. Okay, then I'm not helping you. This going above the chain of command in an organization or anything is disastrous. Why? Because now all the workers are nervous. Because who, when I'm, when I'm working, I report to one person, right? Every company you go to, you have to report to it. You can't report to two different people, right? It's actually one of the proofs that there's only one possible God. You can't have multiple gods, right? Everywhere you go, you have one president, one CEO. You got to have Tawheed. Without one, you have disorder. So you got, I got one. Now, I should only be worried about that one. Right? I can't have my employees going around my back or my clients going around my back. They all went around their back. You got to divide it up. So Hamline University... Uh, these weasels, these weak people, who ha they came upon the right conclusion by accident, really, or in the wrong way. Now they're, they've been heavily criticized by academics and even some American Muslims, including myself. They say the action was a gross violation of academic freedom. No, that's not my critique. That's not my critique. I don't believe in academic freedom. You don't have the freedom to insult people. You don't have the freedom to say kufr. I have a very, we have a very radical view on academic freedom. The academy, academics, as a Muslim, is bound to the Sharia and to God's will. If we were to open up and have an Islamic country, and we have a league of 20 colleges in our country, right? You are as bound to God's law as anybody else. So there's no academic freedom to go and, and blaspheme God, disobey God, all that stuff. You guys keep that for your countries. That's not my belief. So that's not why I was against this, right? I was not against it for gross violation of academic freedom. That's their position. Fine. You have your religion and we have ours. Okay. The, the lecture had no Islamophobic intent. That's who I agree with. She, clearly, she has no intent to injure the Muslims and how they feel or to disrespect the Prophet. She doesn't have the rules that we have regarding the Prophet, but clearly she had respect. Right, she was not. She was telling you in advance. One of the signs of respect is when you're above board. This is what we're doing, okay? If that upsets you, come talk to me. She's above board. And I liked what the care guy said. I think it was care who said there's a big difference between un-Islamic and Islamophobic. We have to separate between the un-Islamic and uh, everyone's un-Islamic, right? You go down your your cul-de-sac, everyone is un-Islamic. Your street, everyone, they're not Muslims. So why, would they, why would they be Islamic? They're not Muslims. But do they hate you? Do they disrespect you? No. So you can get along. The guy said, a guy uh, coming and, and drinking beer. My neighbor drinks beer. It's un-Islamic. He's not trying to offend me. He drinks beer, right? But he comes right in front of my mosques and drinks like this. That's Islamophobic, right? He's trying to offend you. Commenting on the issue for the first time, Hamline president said, Fainese Miller, fueled by commentary not well informed on the particulars of the situ of the situation, we now f and and there's a chance of truth to that. By the way, we are saying based on what we read, that's all we have to base on. Based upon what we read, it was Weasley what they did. We now find ourselves at the heart of a purported standoff between academic freedom and equity. It has escalated to the point where I, members of my executive staff and other campus staff. Most sadly, one of our students now received death threats 
daily threats of violence. I would actually ask you to publicize those threats, right? Publicize them. It's an easy way to shut down dialogue, to be honest. Publicize the threat. Show us where is the threat. And why don't you go and report those threats to the police, right? Because it's very easy to shut stuff down by saying, oh, it's getting violent. We're getting threats. And all of a sudden, get sympathy now. The controversy erupted last year when the Minnesota University let go an art history lecturer, adjunct professor, a.k.a. Miskeen, Erica Lopez Prater, who upset Muslim students by showing images of the Prophet in an online class. You know these online classes, they get very little attention. It's a low-priority operation, and it's just... Yeah, <laughs> the professors hardly put effort to. It's really hard to pay attention. It's so hard to pay attention. Yeah. The professor shared two depictions of the prophet. Okay. Uh, one had a veil and a halo, and one was of the prophet, peace be upon him, receiving revelations created by Rashid al Din, a Persian Muslim scholar and historian. And someone had a fuss that I got it wrong, that I suspected he was a Shi'i. He's not a Shi'i, he was a Sunni. Okay, you happy now? I said he's a Sunni. He said, here, so there. I said, what, Sunnis drink? Sunnis come as zina? Do you think, because he's a Sunni, I'm going to change my position? No. That's, uh, so I wanted to, because you, I, I share the same position as you with regards to how this was handled and yeah. how she also handled it. Particular. But I also feel like there's, there is, especially in, in recent years, with the insulting images that have been published of the Prophet, I feel like there's been enough... Um, like understanding in the general public, even amongst non-Muslims, that any depiction of the Prophet is going to get you a bad result. Is, is, and I think, if knowing that, she probably just should have just not <laughs> not done it to begin with, right? Because like, yeah, if you even if you say, oh well, but, but this is a Sunni who published it, you're talking about a Sunni from what, how many centuries ago? Yeah, and and what was the context, and why did they do it, and were they a devout you know person? Yeah, did they, did they somebody who I mean, there's a lot of Sunnis now who don't respect the Prophet yeah. Muhammad, unfortunately. So, um. So this, this is, I feel like that's something, just a, it's more of a street smart. It's, hey, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't do this because like, I'll just focus on another topic. It's a wonderful, and I would say, proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power and his protection of the Prophet. If it becomes like a thing, if it becomes a worldwide, don't show an image of the Prophet, something bad will happen. That to me would that be a proof of, the, of Allah's protection of the Messenger, peace be upon him. And we don't, and that's not even a condition. They struck the face of the Prophet wasallam. They threw things on the Prophet wasallam. They have killed, Prophets have been killed before. So for a Prophet to be insulted in any way, shape, and form does not decrease from his stature. In fact, the more you're insulting him, the more you're focusing on the Prophet you're, you're, you're thinking about him, right? About Good, that, bad, or ugly, yeah. The, uh, I think Sami had gone to an interfaith once mm -hmm. where there was a, uh, Imam was there, and there was a, a rabbi, and there was a priest, mm -hmm. and uh, the priest said something to the effect of, you know, after they had this very nice dialogue about Islam and Christianity and Judaism, at the end he says, well, he tells the Imam, he said, but you know, you've you've got to admit that there's um, a difference in in the sense something to the effect of like a difference in the quality of or the in, like the the civility of, you know, uh, Christian followers versus Muslim followers, yeah. and in the sense that. You know, we don't we don't go crazy when you when, mm -hmm. when Jesus gets insulted, yeah. right? And, he said, and the Imam says that sounds like a you problem. Like that's you, true. You have not fostered enough love mm, that's for, heavy. for 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 mm -hmm. that people do not get riled up. Of course, it doesn't justify violent you know reactions, but yep. the fact that you haven't fostered enough love for Sayyidina Isa mm -hmm. that you that's don't heavy. get bothered by it. Yeah, that's and true. even I mean we see it in pop culture today. You mm -hmm. you're more likely to see Sayyidina Isa be insulted yeah. or be depicted inappropriately yep. than even the four founding fathers of this country right? yeah. but and then you know whereas Muslims you know even the slightest s slight mm -hmm. the Prophet is You're completely unacceptable uh, yeah. anger disgust is manufactured yeah. it's manufactured by societies part of it we'll say half of it there's an element of it that's fitri it's inherent in the human being like if um, someone throws something smelly or dirty on you, you get disgusted, everyone. But moral-based anger, disgust, and outrage is, it's, it's, it's manufactured. 
in every society. What will the outrage be if you used a racial slur? What will the outrage be if you said the Holocaust doesn't exist or you said something bad about the Holocaust? What will the outrage be or what will the emotion be if you use the same derogatory terminology on the Taliban? Right? What will the outrage be in certain parts like San Francisco and New York if you mock a Trump supporter? Right? Versus if you mock a homosexual. All of this anger and outrage is a branch of the tree of morality and beliefs. We have to understand that, right? We teach this thing. You should be outraged at the offense of Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's a teaching, okay? As you teach the outrage of whatever you believe in, and every society will teach the outrage of what they believe in. I remember a guy in China. He came, a professor from China, and paleo, uh, for came with his fossil finds and he said that the fossil record it it flips Darwin's theory upside down because we don't see a gradual development of these fossils we find them boom right there in front of our face all of a sudden so it it, it indicates like creation rather than evolution he was received with such shock although he was one of the best in his field uh, he's, he laughed. He said, look, in China, I, I, in America, you can criticize the government, but you can't criticize Darwin. In China, we can criticize Darwin, we just can't criticize the government. It's the reverse, right? It's all manufactured. Shock is manufactured. Everything, right? And it is a, it's a fara, it's a branch of your beliefs. Okay. Now, let's see. One of the paintings was an Ottoman painting and that had a veil over the prophet's face all right so haram in her pr statement president miller oh it's a woman all this time i thought fainese was a for some reason i thought miller the whole time fainese i don't know what it was to be honest with you i thought it was a guy for some reason i thought i had read other words somewhere else that the president was a dude anyway she clarified that the professor had not been fired as a widely reported widely reported by the media it's just that her contract was not renewed. Please, stop playing games. Yeah. You know how annoying it is for a university to try to find a professor? It's really hard to find teachers. She said, to suggest that the university does not respect academic freedom is absurd on its face. Hamline is a liberal arts institution, the oldest in Minnesota, the first to admit women, and now led by a woman of color. To deny the precepts upon which academic freedom is based would undermine the foundational principles of this university. Prior, prioritizing the well-being of our students does not in any way negate or minimize the rights and privileges assured by academic freedom. But concepts do intersect. Here's the intersectionality of these liberals. Faculty have the right to teach and research subjects of importance to them and publish their work under the purview of their peers. At the same time, Academic freedom does not operate in a vacuum. It is subject to the dictates of society and the laws governing certain types of behavior. Academic freedom. It's good that she's saying this because we believe in the same thing. Academic freedom, in our view, is subject to the dictates. Like We am talking just as Muslims. It would be subject to the dictates of the Sharia. Okay? Uh, it's uh, the dictates of society and laws... Governing certain behaviors, academic freedom, like many ideological principles, can be manipulated, misunderstood, and misrepresented. This part of the discussion I like, actually. Academic freedom can be a weapon to be used against vulnerable populations. Why? Because on the other end of a professor claiming academic freedom may be a student who lacks tenure, uh, a student who must rely on the professor for a grade, who may be emotionally, intellectually, and professionally harmed, by the professor's exercise of the power they hold. This is going to be a big problem. Right? The students that you deal with every day are getting more and more fragile, emotional, and they're all diverse. So what offends one won't offend the other. What is the one's belief will be the other's offense. Also, the American Federation of Teachers correctly notes that academic freedom and its attendant rights do not mean that anything goes okay so you all have limits who sets the limits 
right? That's the, that's always where we get to with liberal ideologies. When they reach a limit and they say, hey guys, there's got to be boundaries. We say, great, we're glad you said that. Who sets the boundaries, man or creator of man? It notes that faculty must act professionally in their scholarly research and their teaching and their interactions with students and ensure this through policies and procedures that safeguard both students and the academic integrity of the institutions and disciplines. I ask those who presume to judge us the following questions. Yes, we did judge you, so maybe we were wrong. Let's see what you said. Does your defense of, an, of academic freedom, in, again, that's not our claim. It's not our claim. But anyway, does your defense of academic freedom infringe upon the rights of students in violation of the very principles you defend? Second, does it claim that academic freedom is sacrosanct and owes no debt to the traditions, beliefs, and views of students comprise a privileged reaction? Okay. Yeah, you know what? Who, 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 who can have that kind of belief? Someone with no beliefs, right? That y you, have, you owe no debt. That means you, there are no lines here. Academic freedom has no lines whatsoever. Yeah, we're, that's internally incoherent. Right. Anything that's that is relativistic or has no boundaries is internally incoherent. So what if I want to now write and have a course on the opposite of this? Right? You're gonna allow it, right? I guess they would have to allow it. That is why that's the, the whole liberal paradox, right? Do, does does liberalism have room for intolerance? Right? That's that is why Hamline's civility statement, which guards our campus interaction, notes any student, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, belief, deserves equal protection. It is far easier to criticize from the security of our computer screens than it is to have to make the hard decisions that serve the interests of the entire campus community. What disappoints me the most is that little has been said regarding the needs and concerns of our students that all members of our community hold in trust. I hope this changes. It's, it's a good statement, to be honest, uh, as, a re as a reply, right? It's a decent statement, but... Um, it, it just points back to the inability, I would say, for liberals to set any boundaries, all right? Inability of liberals to set any boundaries and the boundary that will get set is the loudest, most emotional person. That's the one who will set the boundaries. Okay, and that all points to the hadith of that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that uh, uh, the sign that a society is ruined is that children dominate it. The children are dominating the society, right? They are the, the essentially shot callers of the society, and one of the reasons for that is that. They are the most loud and emotional, right? So when you don't really have any rules, the one who will win is the loudest and the most emotional, right? Hamline University Board of Trustees wrote their own statement. Recent events have required us to look deeply into our values. We are beautifully, a beautifully diverse community committed to educating students. And sometimes that means we need to make space for hard conversations. This is one of those times. We are listening and we are learning. Hamline University Board of Trustees is actively involved in reviewing the university's policies and responses to recent student concerns and subsequent faculty concerns about academic freedom. Upholding academic freedom and fostering an inclusive, respectful learning environment are both required to fulfill our mission. Basically, you said nothing, right? CARE statement says... In a belated response to the incident, America's largest Muslim organization, CARE, said it discouraged the display of images of the Prophet while also noting that the academic study of ancient paintings depicting him does not by itself constitute Islamophobia. It constitutes an un-Islamic practice. It's not an Islamophobic. I don't believe it's Islamophobic. It's un-Islamic practice. CARE added that it had seen no evidence that Erica Lopez, the professor, had bigoted intent Right, or engaged in Islamophobic in the, in the classroom. Okay? Care said, we never hesitate to call out Islamophobia, but we never use the word Islamophobia lightly. It is not a catch-all term. 
for anything that we find insensitive, offensive, or immoral, or un-Islamic, for example. I'm adding un-Islamic. To determine what constitutes an act of anti-Muslim bigotry or discrimination, we always consider intent, actions, and circumstances. Good statement. He continues, although we strongly discourage showing visual depictions of the Prophet, we recognize that professors who analyze ancient paintings for an academic purpose are not the same as Islamophobes who show such images to cause offense. Based on what we know, we know up to this point, we see no evidence that Erica Lopez acted with Islamophobic intent or conduct. Academics should not be condemned as bigots without evidence or lose their positions without justification. CARE also expressed support for the Muslim students at Hamline and encouraged schools to consider the perspective of students who argue that displaying depictions of the Prophet in classrooms is harmful and also unnecessary, given they represent a small and late-stage part of the vast uh, his Muslim history of art. Uh, CARE encouraged school officials, academics, students and other others involved in the situation at the local and national level to re-examine the controversy with open minds and pledge to do what it can to help resolve the conflict. Islamic artwork and iconography dating back to early Muslim history center largely around calligraphy and geometric designs because of the scholarly opinion that limited, discouraged, or outright forbade drawing of living beings, especially prophets and other figures whose images might be subjected to idolatry. Uh, no image of the Prophet ﷺ were drawn during or anywhere near his lifetime. The vast majority of Muslims therefore consider this sacrilegious and offensive. It's not offensive, it's haram. There's a big difference, right? Uh, the difference is like we're not judging by our emotions. Yeah. Like if it's a f people who Thank say, you. That's I can't what do it because I'm offended. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, thank you. So offensive, if I allow you to do it's, uh, something's offensive, it's, uh, if we open that door, there, there's no way objectively to predict the future, right? To predict what I should do in the future, right? So offensiveness in our culture, in our ethos, should be based upon a reason, right? You shouldn't be, if, uh, you can't just be offended. I need to know what the rules are in dealing with you in the future, that's why you, you, I, I don't deal with such people because there's no way to, for me to predict which way this, what's gonna, what's, uh, which way this is going. And, and to the last point that you read, yeah, and that's kind of the, the, the question I was thinking. Is, to me, it seems odd that, and I don't, I don't remember what the topic of her course was, mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that made uh, Islamic art unique and distinct from mm -hmm. all of the arts was that it didn't use imagery yeah because of this specific idea that imagery not just of the prophet but he, he, human imagery in general was generally discouraged um, especially in sacred places like masajid and things like that yeah. so we to me it seems weird that that was her focus mm -hmm. and again I, I i agree with your 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 position on this on the specific issue but it's just speaking strictly about her focus on showing images of the prophet sallam it seemed weird that that was her focus given that the vast majority of Islamic art mm -hmm. throughout Islamic history has nothing to do with imagery. Exactly. And this is this is actually what separated us from That's, Christianity, right? You, it's hard to find even. Exactly. In a, if, you, if you were going through Islamic literature, if you were living a Muslim life in the ancient times, for centuries on end, no one in your country will have ever made an image of the Prophet. Right. Right? Like e e Egypt. Nothing. Is it ever recorded that anyone ever did this? Go anywhere, anywhere in the Islamic his, Islamic sites, yeah. and you go to the masajid or even the You're palaces, you don't find anything. Yeah. So it seems to me really, a little bit weird that that was her focus. Because that's that, true too. Just, yeah. just like, well, what's it's like if I go to uh, you know study Christian art and I talk about like Latin calligraphy. It's exactly. not like a you, thing. Right? Exactly. So like it's not. So <laughs> that's hilarious. So that's a great point. That's why know. we have you on here. <laughs> I have but, to take a one second break. Yeah. Um, Ryan will talk to you about the art view classes today. And tell you how to join ArcView, et cetera, et cetera. Bismillah. So more uh, recent news is that we've opened up Telegram group as well. As people on YouTube have seen, uh, the link is being passed around for Telegram group, where in which we will uh, give updates on all the Safina Society operations going on, specifically the soup kitchen, the Mawalid, Dhikr nights, classes, from Darul Fatih, 
youth classes, kids' dicker nights, and other programs, special programs that are going on. Um, all of these pictures, videos, and updates will be sent into this Telegram group. So for those who are interested in joining, the link is being passed around uh, YouTube, inshallah ta'ala, and some of the group chats, and you can join that, as well as uh, information about the live stream. For instance, today we started a little late. It would be beneficial to be on that chat so you can know that we're starting a little late. Um, so updates on, on that live stream or when a guest is coming on, uh, that will be posted on the Telegram as well. As far as ArcView, uh, tonight's classes are very nice, mashallah ta'ala. At 4 o'clock, Dr. Shadi will be reading in the same place. He'll be reading uh, hadith from Imam Nawawi's Sharh on Sahih Muslim for an hour from 4 to 5, arcview.org. I think that's ArcView Plus class. After that, we have Sheikh Osama teaching Shafi'i Fiqh. Um, he's continuing from last term. So now they're in Kitab al-Salah. And then after that, we have, uh, what is it? Tuhfatul Murid fi Sharh Jawara Tawheed, which is Imam Bayjuri's Sharh on Jawara Tawheed by Imam Ibrahim al-Laqani. This is a very important book, and subhanAllah, uh, I went on the class, I didn't see many students on there, and I was talking to Sheikh Osama, and I was telling him, you know, people must not understand the importance of Tuhfatul Murid and Jawhar Tawheed in general because this is a very important class. So I recommend everybody who is curious about the Islamic sciences or you know has been wondering about the depths that our tradition goes into, you should really register on arcview.org. Um, it's equal to the price of like one coffee but instead you could get your photo ayn, right? What is obligatory on you to know? Uh, we probably spend like 60 bucks a month on coffees. And that's being generous. So to look at arcview.org, arcview basic is $10 a month. Plus, I don't know what it is, maybe it's 35 or $40 a month or something. A lot of these classes, they're not large groups either. So you have time with the mashayikh as well. You have their WhatsApp contacts when you join. You enter into the group chats. There's always Q&A going on. SubhanAllah, I'm in this Mar Maliki Fiqh uh, ArcView chat. Just all day, Sheikh Harun and Dr. Shadi are answering Q&A questions. So I highly recommend going on because some of these questions that we have, like somebody was asking today about their daughter, whether their daughter, you know, it was a, it was a pretty important question. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But alhamdulillah, it was answered within 10 minutes of being asked. These types of resources, we can't take them for granted. We can't overlook them because they're literally at our fingertips nowadays. And as Habib Omar says, that every advancement that comes in our life, it comes with a spiritual wisdom and a way that it can be used for khair. So we should be using these devices that we have for khair. And inshallah ta'ala, our view is a, is a means for that. So... Lastly, again, uh, arcview.org and register to catch those classes that are going on today and pretty much daily. All righty. Thank you very much, Ryan, for that. Last news article of the day. <sighs> Ever heard of Majid Nawaz? No. Majid Nawaz was someone who was an extremist part of some organization, maybe the Khilafah organization or something. But his views were pretty, uh, very strong and ultra-conservative, and we got to get the kuffar, and we got to build an Islamic state. He then, uh, I think he got jailed or something. He got traumatized. He swung so far the other way, became a hardcore liberal, to the point that his views are outside of Islam. Hardcore. I mean, he was a murtad, essentially. All the while, though, causing a lot of fitna in the community, creating uh, Quilliam, Quilliam 
Institute. Abdullah Quilliam was one of the Salihin, first Muslims of, of England, right? Yeah. So the organization that he started really is a disservice to him because Abdullah Quilliam was a, a, a pious Sunni Muslim. And they opened this Quilliam organization, whatever it's called, and they started... Uh, putting out these papers and having these conferences with arguing for things that are complete kufr. Well, apparently now, he's come back to Islam. And some people are saying, oh, well, Don, we don't trust you. Because you changed your opinion now twice so far. You went from being Hizb tahrir I think it was Hizb tahrir or something like that. Then you swung to now being from doing a hardcore liberal that's basically a murtad, almost. Khilaf, <sighs> yeah. And then, which by the way, some of them are are fine, right? Some of their thinkers are, are okay, right? Most of their meetings, um, most of their discussion and their discourse, quite to be quite honest with you, I don't like it because all they end up doing is arguing about Khilaf with other Muslims. Not establishing khilafah, right? Or coming close. And they haven't answered the simple question of where would you start your khilafah? Aren't all countries taken, <laughs> right? So their thing is, no, we would convert a general and that general would do a coup. And we'd start the khilafah. So then why are you talking to me? Go talk to some general. Good luck finding a general who's going to obey you. And then hand you the khilafah after that. It's so far off. But Majid Nawaz then, because he changed his view twice, now he's Sunni Muslim now, apparently, and a Sufi. People are saying, uh, I don't know about you, right? Because we don't trust you. But they're like, hold on a second, you guys just gave Andrew Tate a chance. You're giving Andrew Tate a chance. Why not give him a chance? Right? And obviously, that's the case because, um, yes, Andrew Tate may be what he you think, whatever you want to think, and fine, I'm not defending anything that he has ever said or done, but, but we do not see his history of going from view to view to view to view yet. So he may have been one of the most foul people in your view, but was he consistent upon that foulness, and was he honest? Because if he was then now as a Muslim, if he submits to that and he observes the same consistency, same honesty, that's a good thing, right? Saint, what did I always been saying about Kyrie Irving? I don't believe anything that he says. Kyrie Irving became Muslim. I'm not celebrating this because every other year, Kyrie Irving has a new kick. Every other year. And lo and behold, what happened? He announced himself, no, I'm a universalist. He's not even a Muslim anymore. Okay. Whereas there was another basketball player. Um, who's on the Celtics number? Who's one of their top players? on Jalen Brown. Brown. He said he's a Muslim. Did we go see him with an entourage to go break his fast? Making all sorts of attention. No, he just became a Muslim on his own, right? So the question to me when someone enters Islam is, is about, it's not about their past. It's about do they have a track record of consistency and honesty in what they're doing. That's what you look for. So Majid Nawaz has a track record of changing his position a lot on major things. That's the reason why we hold, it's going to be like, okay, let's see where this is going. And also, isn't there like the factor of like, for Ridda, like it depends what it what is based on. Like if it's, if he committed kufr based on disrespect to the Prophet yeah. it's like harder to accept him back. You know, yeah. that's like, you, you don't really come back from that type of thing or magic yeah like if someone committed kufr because they did magic you're not really coming back from that and the reason is that black magic requires to um desanctify the quran black magic there's white magic and there's black magic white magic is a kabira but that is using muslim jinn to get your goals across that's a major sin um but black magic that's devilish stuff okay that you're dealing with the devils of the jinn, and you have to desanctify, you have to uh, to to desecrate 
Islamic symbols. For those of you who don't know, Nawaz was invited onto a podcast by a prominent Muslim YouTuber last week and expressed interest before going on to talk about his sheikh. The invite was subsequently rescinded. Mm. Oh, he was invited onto a podcast, but it was rescinded. Um, but that was not stopped. Has not stopped speculation that Nawaz may have changed his old habits of targeting Muslims and Islam. Nawaz's comments also immediately led to a backlash with prominent Muslim activists saying that he should not be platformed under any circumstances given the damage he has done to the community over a long period of time. This subsequently led to a loud minority of Muslims who have been attacking Andrew Tate for several weeks due to the haram things he has said and done in the past, crying hypocrisy from the rooftops. I don't think they're the same at all. Not the same at all. Sayyidina Omar wanted to kill the Prophet. Is there anything worse than that? Right? But he was always, whatever he had his mind on, he, he achieved it. And he didn't flip-flop. So when he came to Islam, he came with that power. Right? That strength and that consistency. Someone who flip-flops, enters Islam. So if Islam is your third choice, like you did three different things, right? Four different things. And now Islam is your fourth thing. How do I know that you're not going to be on your fifth thing in another year? And that this is just a pit stop, like it was for Kyrie Irving, right? But I think the difference between the two examples is, at least this point, at this point, that Tate has been a Muslim for only two months. Nawaz was born Muslim, but has made a career from bashing Islam, befriending some of the most critical anti-Muslim polemicists, like Sam Harris, Douglas Murray, and has openly professed his disbelief in the foundation's of the religion no i disagree with him that's not the issue it's not that he was against islam it's that he's always changing his position he went from being a hardcore khilafa to non-liberal and now he's a sufi muslim i don't know about this right it's it has nothing to do with me that he was against islam or say no was against islam it doesn't matter if he, these days born muslim means almost very little because you could be born muslim and not know a thing about islam and then come to hate the culture that you're in, right? And be the worst person against Islam. Okay? The question is, how many times do you flip-flop? Okay? Right, if there's any good comments, you, we could start merging the comments in about this subject in case be, uh, someone has a good opinion here or a good take on this. Well... We don't know. That's the thing. But what do you have a track record for? Flip flopping. Yeah. Right? But is his mic on? It's not on him. Yeah, oh. His mic is on? No, it's not. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, it's the flip flopping. Right? You have two kids. One kid is very consistent in hating dieting. Mm -hmm. I'll eat Skittles, I'll eat ice cream, I don't care. The other kid has a different diet every week. Every month he's in a different fad, different phase. Then the unhealthy kid who's been unhealthy for 10 years says, you know what? I'm done with that. I'm going to be healthy. Which one do you have faith in? I'm going to have faith in the guy, the one who is consistent, right? Mm -hmm. Who knows how to follow through with something despite all the hardships. I'm not going to go with the one who had a closer view to me, but he always flip-flops, mm -hmm. right? So whereas Tate may have made serious mistakes from ignorance or even just being an evil guy, Malcolm X was, he said himself, his nickname was the devil, was Satan in jail, right? Ignorance or even evil, all right? And, and may still engage in activities that practicing Muslims could never endorse, okay? In which case he should be public, publicly corrected. Nawaz has outright rejected elements of the religion with the knowledge that what he's doing is kufr. Okay, I still disagree. It's not about that. It's about, he's a flip-flopper, that's why. Let me say this clearly. By no means do I, and by the way, if Nawaz ever wants to come to the public again, he needs a campaign of apology for what he did. A public toba, just as you publicly led so many people astray, you owe the ummah uh, that you want to be part of and get our attention. You love our attention. That's the problem. The guy loves attention. 
he went and apostated. The liberals clapped for you for five minutes, right? Then they kicked you to the curb when they didn't need you anymore, right? Now you're back with us. We'll give you eyeballs. That's why you know that, because he's one of us. He's a Muslim. You know that you're going to get eyeballs with us. That's the suspicion that people have. Because literally, he was getting rounds of applause and money from all the liberals for years when he was doing his anti-Islam stuff. Life moved on. Liberals don't care anymore, right? Mm. Now when you're irrelevant, now you're back as a Sunni Muslim. So it gives people a reason to raise, to, 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 to question the issue. If he wants to be taken uh, seriously, he should... Uh... Give back the money that he got. Ah, uh, thank you. Disband the institute that, uh, that says wrong things. Or it's, no, the re, his real repentance yeah. is alter the bylaws of the of the of the institute yeah. and the views of the institute. Fire all the people that you hired. If I don't even think that thing's running. To be honest, the guy has no money. Yeah, he's got no money. He's got no attention. He's been on the fringes. He's been completely. Uh, you're, you see these these ex Muslims, whatever these are, they go. They get you get clapped for like a circus clown for five minutes, then you're done for. They don't need you anymore. Okay? So if you're someone who craves attention and your filter of decision-making is attention, you're going to come back. That's why people are suspicious. Like Mike Tyson. The guy's a fasc. Right? The stuff that he does, he's publicly sinful. Right? If I'm, if it, the legal category of Mike Tyson is fasc. But why do people love him? And the Muslims love him. Because the guy never flip-flopped. He never was a righteous person that became a fasiq. He was a kafir. And then he became Muslim. And he never really got to practicing everything perfectly. Right? Or even well. Right? But his belief changed. But he went up. And he stayed there. He plateaued at that level. I love the guy. As a, as, as a guy who became a Muslim, he never spouted, or he never went and, pro, uh, and put himself out there, right? He stayed as he was, right? To a degree. Maybe he left off certain some things. But what I love is that the, 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 he never went down, and he never flip-flopped, okay? He always said I'm a Muslim. He never flip-flopped on that. But he also never advertised a false product, that I'm a pious Muslim, look at me, and let me tell you this about Islam or that. Or else. He never speaks about Islam. Just went on Umrah too, right? And he never publicized that. That was someone took that picture. He didn't take that picture. Like he never even tried to publicize it or be a Muslim or even be part of the community in the sense of I'm your leader, I'm here, I'm a Muslim. He never even tried any of that. There, he's, he did nothing in the same breath, in the same way that he never did anything that would make him uh, an example for Muslims. Likewise, at the same time, he never did anything to cause us to, to be disappointed. Right? It's not like he went and was a good Muslim for like 10 years, then he quit. No. He just, he just went up a notch from a kafir to a Muslim who practices a little bit. To me, you went up. In your graph, you went up. Right? You never went down. And he's been consistent on that. He's not a guy who I see changing his views and opinions every two weeks. So the, the author here says, the author whose name is Jamal Muhammad. He says, I do not, by, let me make this clear, by no means exonerate Tate for some of the things he has continued to say after his conversion. But this insistence that he, can't, he, that he come out and make public toba seems a bit too much. Oh, it's still too early. Give him some time to marinate. And by the way, he's going to jail. If, there was, if we could just de determine a sign of someone's acceptance, right, of divine acceptance, for your repentance, the best thing you do is to start paying the price and to be removed from what you were doing, right? If he's genuine, I want to change my ways and be good with God. Now God is going to make you pay the price, whether by conspiracy, by lies, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You're going to pay a price for what's the stuff that you used to do to, and get purified and maybe learn and get humble and spend some time with the Quran in jail. I think that's the best thing that could happen, right? Right? That, to me, is the best thing. Jail has done so much for people who never would have contemplated otherwise or been humble. Be humble a little bit too, right? If you're going to represent God and you want to go this route, because he is not like Mike Tyson. He is telling people how to live, right? 
he's gonna he's telling me people how to live you're in the moralizing sphere of of things now as a muslim you have to moralize as a muslim you're not going to be just admitted into that for nothing you got to get purified you got to go learn you got to spend you got to be buried for a while right go spend 10 years in jail five years in jail seven years in jail be buried be ignored face that music test your sincerity all that you got to go for it can you imagine a muslim now coming hey i'm the top m right the top g no, no muslim talks like that you want to now be involved in islam and submit it to allah and telling people how to live now do it right get cooked be buried right so that's why i think for him the best thing to happen is to go to jail personally he says i'm intelligent enough to separate what tate has said that i don't agree with from things he has said that makes sense and keep in mind that he converted two months ago not two decades so, so the bar i have for tate is that of a two-month convert which is pretty low in a year two years beyond the expectations will change yeah i would give it five years right seven years and probably the best thing for him is to go contemplate in jail have a complete transformation stop saying this top g nonsense yeah it's funny okay it's cute for two seconds for 18 year olds for seven year olds right Khalas, you're how old is the guy andrew tate 38 39 Khalas, grow it's time to grow up and act like if you're going to be a muslim act like a muslim right <clears throat> you gotta read this here I wonder if, he's, if someone gave him the Sira book. We need to give him that. We need to give him the Sira book, and he needs to get the links, mbsc.org slash links, and go hit convert links. I embraced Islam 15 years ago, says the author, Jamal Muhammad, and much of what Tate has professed to doing in the past, drinking and womenizing, I also did. I took, it took a couple years for me to get together. Okay. So I think we need to do a balance on both sides. Don't look at Tate as a role model as he still has lots of room to improve. But don't also be harsh, uh, so harsh that you put demands on him that we never put on another public personality that embraced the faith. Again, I have to, you have to separate between Tate and other mo people who became Muslim. He's in the moralizing world. He's telling people how to live. That's not Mike Tyson. That's not any other convert who can stay below the radar and be a, be a celebrity in their world, but below the radar in the Dawa world. Tate, if as a Muslim, he would be in the Dawa world, right? You're in the, because he's in the moralizing sphere. That's what he's teaching people to do, teaching people how to live. So that's why for him, it's a precarious situation, right? Because his career is telling people how to live, right? And those videos. But now you're a Muslim. Okay. That's what I'm saying. When he, when he converted, there was a very small window where people were like, okay, what is he going to do now? Is he going to yeah. continue or is he going to... And and honestly, him being pulled out of that is the best thing for him. That's what I'm saying. And like, it's... Uh, because again, like even with Muslims, many Muslims looking up to him. Yeah. It was... For me personally, it was problematic because there are uh, shiuch who spend decades mm -hmm. and, you know, 10, 15, 20 years studying before they come and talk to the public. Yeah. Right? And 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 we're supposed to be taking them far mm. more seriously yeah. than we should ever take somebody like Tate. And yeah. uh, he simply converted, and within a week of converting, he's back on his podcast, back on, back on, you know, hosted by this person and that person, yeah. and talking the same way he was talking. And I also think he has a very skewed idea of, of what, like, what appealed to him about Islam was not yeah. is not what should have, mm -hmm. like, you know, been the driving factor. Yeah, you know, for him, it's like that continued sense of womanization and all these things oh islam lets me marry four women islam lets me. sure you can do that but that's, that should be the driving factor of well you know, you know. that and, foundation is going to get tested yeah, over time yeah. that's the, when a person converts the foundation of their conversion has to be strong if it's if it's weak you either correct it or you will collapse and leave islam this guy to me and just just my opinion he seems to be a guy who is a black and white guy, and when he makes a decision, he's going to stick to that decision. Because he's went and said things that are outrageous and faced enormous amounts of backlash. So he seems to me a guy who, when he makes a decision, he's making that decision. That person, you can easily deal with him. And the way I would deal with such a person, I said, are you claiming to submit to Allah? Then go submit to Allah. 
zip it and pay the price. Right? If you want to talk in public on how to live, go pay the price. Okay? Exit stage right. Learn. Humble yourself. You're not a musician who we could say, okay, just take your time, whatever, because you're not in, or an athlete, whatever. Take your time, whatever, because your public persona is not linked to Islam. No, your public persona is linked to Islam and is linked to telling people how to live. You need, if you're going to do this and you're going to submit to Allah, you're a tough guy, right? The cage and the octagon and MMA, Allah's tougher than you, right? And he's put you in a cage right now, right? He's tougher than you. Don't mess around. Go get educated. Go pay the price. So, and I wouldn't have the hesitation to be harsh with him. You're a tough guy. So take it, right? And I say that with, with a good intent, not, not like I'm, I'm putting him down or anything. Okay. I agree that much of what he has said is unpalatable to me as a Muslim, but just because he has said things in the past that cannot be Islamically justified... That doesn't mean women are being abused as a direct correlation. I'm not even going to get into that, whether Tate did that or not. It would be like, and by the way, it could possibly be some powers that be just want to shut him up. Fine, but it doesn't matter. You're going to end up in jail. It's probably still something that's good for you. It would be like me saying men get taken advantage of by women and extorted monetarily because Cardi B said that when she was an escort, she used to rob men when they were unconscious. And because she has stated this proudly, and she is influential amongst some young women in the West, she is to blame for the actions of others. I would, I would be interested to see the uh, progressive types. How would they react if Cardi B became a Muslim? They would celebrate it, no doubt about it. So their filter is not the a purely objective filter; it's slanted, and we're all slanted. But you got to have the right slant. I wouldn't do that because making the correlation is absurd. Unrealistic standards, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, all right, it's a, good, it's a good article. And that leads us now to our, our comments section. Rai, you need to give me the, inshallah, the... Uh, um, you need to give me the Instagram comments today because I left my, my iPad at home. Tanweer Institute is here. By the way, we're going to have Tanweer... Um, if it's a Desi, it would be called the Tenvir Institute. But the Tenvir Institute, I wonder how Desis are handling this. You wrote Tenvir with a W. And Sheikh Omar Popo, you are from Pakistan. Oh, he's Afghani? Okay. Well, Sheikh Omar Popo is coming on our, on our program soon. And if you don't know him, you will, because if you're in Virginia, you could benefit from him. All righty, Raya, if you have something, let us know. But Safa, you get the first comment, Safa. But many interviewed him and said nothing to contradict his, uh, his ideas. They were harsh with their sisters, Safa said. Um, it was disappointing seeing all the Muslim men in the Dawa scene support Tate, really hurtful. You just support that he became a Muslim. He, he did what he had to do. You have no choice but becoming a Muslim. Yani, that's the divine submission, or the, the, the divine call to submit. So we applaud that he fulfilled his obligation, just as anyone else would. But beyond that, he doesn't get an endorsement of any kind. Okay? Safat so says, take time off social media, humble yourself, Thank you. That's it. I would say you're a tough guy. You joined a religion that has standards. Don't tell people how to live their life. Don't bring up Islam. Don't claim to represent Islam. Don't, tell, don't do any of that stuff. Go and, and humble yourself to this Lord and this creator. Take knowledge from where it was come from. And after many, many years, Allah will call, if you're sincere, and true, and you change your ways, Allah will change the hearts of the people towards you, and maybe you can contribute after that. There is no issue, Juice says, if people learn about Islam through him being the catalyst, so be it. We had a shahada through Andrew Tate. We did. We had a shahada. You know a lot. Yeah. 
There's a lot. Yeah. If listen, if Cardi B became a Muslim, Muslim, and she, I love Islam, but she's still doing her 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 whatever her career, and now all these types of girls who dress like her, who do the same things like her, now all of a sudden becoming Muslim, all the Muslims will be celebrating this because there's a liberal slant. Okay, like what she's doing is is as haram as anything else, right? But the world that we live in has a liberal slant to it. So if you always compare things to the opposite, um, well, maybe that someone will say, well, she isn't hateful towards men or hurtful towards men. Okay, fine. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case. Didi says, converted in the 70s and didn't start speaking publicly about Islam until the late 80s, 90s, no interviews, no talks. Who is she talking about? Yusuf Islam. And he wasn't even in the sphere of dawah. He was just an entertainer, right? And there are many, many, many people in very public spheres who become Muslim or take on some different views and just continue that view under the radar. And they continue doing their thing, whether halal or haram, they keep doing it, right? So, but again, I, I bring you up. The issue is that he is in a sphere that talks about morals, how to live, what a man should do, what a woman should do. This is the sphere of Islam and revelation. That's the difference. Okay. How many salat tunjina should I recite for abundance? Abundance. 100 is good. When I saw the interview of Tate with Pierce Morgan, the way he said positive things about Islam and on such a big platform, I think nobody talked about Islam in such a proud way on a big platform, says Umm Maryam. I didn't see that interview. But Ibrahim says, on another solution for Tate is to go on a spiritual journey, live in Mauritania. Um, there is some glory in that, though. But jail, <laughs> jail. I'm serious, <laughs> because jail gives you no option, right? I can take pictures of myself with the sheikh, right? That my ego just goes up, right? Jail, it's none of that, right? Abid Niaz is glad he's out of social media. When is Sheikh Rami coming on the stream? Says Sophia, he is coming, but we don't have a date yet. Yeah. Safa says men, Safa you know the Egyptian way of saying it is Safa with a Hamza Safa many Muslim men were his fans before he converted they subscribed to this ideology Chocolate Wallace says I don't know of anyone in the Dawah scene that condoned his behavior they did welcome his conversion and rightfully so uh, Tahira says when women revert they are more stronger than men, in my opinion. Melody says, Tate's nefs is very strong. It's true. Dino Palavra, he should go to Tareem. No, 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 we don't want him giving Habib Omar a bad name. <laughs> right? Jail, jail, I'm telling you. Jail makes you think. It makes you humble. It makes, it should, at least. Mike Tyson said jail was the best thing for his life. Big question is, will he still have the following if and when he really starts following Islam, his views will change drastically if he does things right. And I guarantee he will not have the same following. Guaranteed. There's women all over his pictures. There's music. There's glasses. There's cars that are absurd. There's smoking. There's drugs. That's what got him the millions of views, right? And when people say, oh, what he did, imams couldn't do. Yeah, because imams can't have ukrainian girls all over the couch right it's, it's, it's that's cool. why these are these are cheap views thank you that's how it works if cardi be converted and still continued they would question her islam but she but she'd be muslim celebrities 
here in the U.S. Yeah. Particularly black celebrities that are Muslim that are not practicing at any level. We don't. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody goes around questioning their Islam. We just kind of consider it be like, okay, he's like even Shaquille O'Neal is supposedly Muslim. Right? Yeah, Shaq. I mean, uh, he doesn't go around to, like you know pretending to be something he's not. He's like, oh, that's Muslim. why he could take as long as he wants. Doesn't matter. He never speaks about Islam. Yeah. Right. He never speaks about Islam. Nor is he a representative of Muslims. It's not yeah. like he didn't come to Masajid. But by the way, he did say that he was a Muslim. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think he went on Omra one time. Yeah. Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> <laughs> is he any good at it? Uh, <laughs> How small was the ball in his hand? <laughs> Sinead O'Connor became a Muslim yeah. after a traumatic end of her life or second half of her life. Right. Really bad. Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle Dave became a Muslim. Yeah. So all those, though, none of them are in the sphere that's close to Dawah. Mm-hmm. Do what you want. Be that as slow as... That, that's that's like, the and nobody questions that. I don't think anybody... But like, yeah. like so I'm saying, if Cardi B became a Muslim, I don't think anybody would question If that. Cardi B became a Muslim, I don't know Right? The, the thing is, the difference, the, the two factors we're bringing up is, number one, are you in a field that, that is related to Dawah or Islam? That's number one. Like if a, if a professor of Islam, non-Muslim professor in Islam, of Islam, and they say a lot of things that are kufr and haram, and they question a lot of things, now he becomes Muslim, it's going to be a different spotlight than if a professor of biology becomes, or, or, or a professor of, 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 or someone in technology becomes Muslim, right? It's a different spotlight, okay? If a biologist becomes Muslim, there's a spotlight. What are you going to say about evolution of the human being, right? So that's the first factor. The second factor is the, 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 the track record of the person. Is he a flip-flopper, right? And that's what we said about Kyrie Irving, it's not that we question his, his Islam. I question his character, his, perso- his total personality, right? You know, his total personality. He, he's, he's unstable. His stability is what I question. Majid Nawaz. It's not even that he, was, he said bad things about Islam, said Omar wanted to kill the Prophet It's not that. It's that his emotional stability is in question. Is he just going to leave this... Malay- I think now he has a Malaysian sheikh now. Let's see how this goes. In five years. What is the meaning, says Sufi, of Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins in istata'atum anta manfudu min aqatar as-samawati wal-aldi fanfudu la tanfudu na'ilib sultan. If you want to go out in space, this ayah means, go, you won't go without sultan. Sultan is knowledge and the permission of Allah. Great knowledge. Some people said the verse says you'll never live in space. And the, if, if, you, if you want to go out, then go is almost like, um, it's not permission, it's like sarcastic. Hyperbot, you'll never go. Oh, go, go ahead, like that. Others said no, it is possible, but sultan here means great knowledge. And Allah knows best. We'll see if Musk makes his space station out there. Or not. Yusuf Islam is actually one of the trustees of London Central Mosque. Yusuf Islam, to be honest with you, did it right. He quit on the spot when nobody would have said he had to, right? We all are agreement. When a, if you're in a Muslim and you're in a non dawa sphere and non dawa related space, nobody's going to sit there and say, stop doing what you're doing immediately right now. But he was very sincere with it. He quit on the spot. Um, Mini Star is saying there's someone else very recently became a Muslim, but they continue to sing. Is there any etiquette on what to recite or to do when moving into a new house? Yes, there is. The first thing is the adhan and the iqama and salah. And preferably, if you could, in each prayer, each prayer in a different room. To spread the adhan and spread the iqam and spread the salah. Others have said something that uh, is a sunnah too, which is the wakira. The wakira is after you settled the house, you invite the community and your friends and your family and members of the community and some of the fuqara to the house for food. Okay? Those are the two sunnah to do. Some people say if the house was abandoned, then go around to each room and announce that you are you are moving in soon 
and seek permission for any of the jinn who are living there to leave. Some people have actually said that. Okay. You moved to a new place? Was it abandoned though? No, no, it's okay, like that's a good. rented property. It's that's good. Yeah. When is Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad coming on the stream? That will be the com the the um the collab of two styles, two opposite East Coast uh, and and the opposite side of the pond. Uh, Rai, could you please put his name on the... Uh, I'm going to have to get polite. I'm going to have to start being polite and eloquent. All right, let me let me practice. How would I have Yusuf Islam, uh, 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 Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad on the stream? I'm going to have to become well-mannered and mature. Okay, I'm going to sit with my back straight. What makes even students who stay with ulama extreme? Do you think that there is a problem not just with students, but with the teachers as well? Some want them to stay in the group, but not guiding. This is a question by ABCDEF. I would say that if a, stud if a sheikh has many, many, many extreme students, there's a problem with the sheikh. If the sheikh has one extreme student, and everyone else is good, then it's the student. That's a problem. Mm. I'm assuming by that... Mm -hmm. I'm assuming any kind of extremism in behavior. Yeah, And also maybe she's, or ABCDEF is talking about students who, who are extreme in their attachment with the sheikh. Okay? Like they're too much with the sheikh. And I don't think that that's... Always a healthy thing. Yes. Okay. How much wood? Juice is asking. Which car? Which, which car are you on? You're not in the driveway, right? I'm in the driveway, too. Sophia says, I've been off social media for two years. Alhamdulillah. I only go to Twitter once a week to give my posts some support. Thank you very much. I have been actually so disinterested in Facebook. Yeah, I don't write posts anymore. I feel like I should write posts, but I don't. I don't know why. Uh, firstly, this is my new thing. where I, I like this a lot more. But also, Facebook itself has become so difficult to open up the app. Yes. There's a million things going on, right? I think they did a terrible job. Yeah, My personal thing. Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't, I, I just f feel no... Uh... Yeah. There's too many ads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. of a relevant page, right? Yep. Because of a page that I follow. Of course. Because I like the post from a relevant page yep. that I follow. So like it's like two degrees removed. Yeah. And they're just putting that on my timeline. I was like, yeah. this is not relevant to my timeline. Well, what happened with me was that I kept seeing um, fa fahsha in yes, my thing. That's another thing, too. Yeah. I actually, because uh, my, my Instagram is just Google. It's yeah. Not a person, mm. So I don't post there. But I, I, I had initially converted to a person like a few years ago on Instagram. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up like before I went on Umrah actually I went up to practice I was like, mm. hey, let me see how I can move myself on social media so about a month before Umrah I removed like out of 600 people I was following I dialed it down to like 100 yeah and I just kept it to like very close people that I follow mm -hmm. and then Facebook I got rid of so when I went on Umrah I shut down both apps completely I removed them yeah from my I didn't even I didn't even notice that I wasn't shutting down yeah. social media I had, uh, for some reason, seen... I, I, I was on all animal... Uh, yeah, because yeah, like hunting. And then I had seen um, Steph Curry. There's a page just for Steph Curry's shots yeah. and highlights. So I like that. But the people who like that also like follow women's yeah. like images, fascia. So then the algorithm lumped me into that. Yeah. So when I went down and I unsubscribed to all the sports uh, pages... 
right, that I was on, then I stopped getting the women. Yeah. So that's basically, now you know the algorithm. Yeah. Manar Zeki says, what's the Madaki opinion on scholars such as Ibn Taymiyyah? We have the Madaki, uh, if have basically nothing to do with uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. He is a scholar of the Hanbalis, and he has many, many, what we they, what the Asha'ara would consider blunders in Aqid, the things that he said about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which would suggest tashbih and tajseem. And his fiqh is for the Hanabin only in the first place, because his premise is the Hanbali usul. And his Aqidah is also that which is against the Asha'ara. So we end up having, he uh, does not appear not once in the Madaki curriculum, not once, except uh, they may, contemporary books may reference his epistle on the Amal of Ahl al-Medina, and they say it's very good. Now, when we say that on fiqh, it's almost like Imam Nawi also doesn't appear in the Madaki curriculum. If you're a Madaki, you will not study the fiqh of Imam Nawi, you'll study his sharh of hadith, but you will have nothing to do with the fiqh of Imam Nawi. That doesn't take anything away from that. So I'm not taking anything away that the that the uh, fiqh and the fatawa of Ibn Taymiyyah may have excellent, um, you know, fatawa, but it had nothing to do with the Madikis or the Shafis or the Hanafis. So, how to make a 38 year old 38 year old man love Deen? What's a good starting point for someone who doesn't feel drawn to Islamic knowledge or ibadah at all? They only pray five times a day. Uh, friends, your friends. If he, if he could become friends with anyone who is a masjid-going person or a masjid-going group of people. Only a few questions left. Um, Usher is kind of in dawah because his work in Africa, which he doesn't even brag about, Usher is a musician, right? Yeah. Sinead O'Connor got made fun of so badly by um, Hannah Montana. Why? Because she she's she had like, you know Hannah Montana? Whatever her name is, right? <laughs> I know her as Hannah Montana. She, but I felt, I really felt bad for her. Here you go, you're at the top of your to get your game and you're going to put down and trash a woman who's had such difficulty in her life right to me she's trash she's the one who's trash yeah mike trout is here i guess uh he's not playing baseball today i was raised muslim but i went through an atheist phase as a teen allah guided me back and i have missed prayer since yes make up those prayers Make up those, estimate the number of years and repay those prayers two times a day. Okay. What is the difference between a Sunni and Shia hadith? And can Sunnis accept some Shia hadith? Shia, as in like 12ers, they don't use the same system of Isnad as the Sunnis do. So we don't look at their hadith at all. We don't even look at them. Emptying the cup with a really nice uh, logo there says, and what of the collection of among the Shia that are said to be collections of Ahlul Bayt? We don't look at their hadith at all. Full stop. Does the word ignorance in the hadith that says every sin is committed by an ignorance means overtaken by your desires? Yes, ignorance meaning if you were to see the amount of damage that you are doing when you commit sins and you still do it, that's got to be ignorance. That's what it means. There's only one way to settle this dispute between Tate and Cardi B becoming Muslim is that Cardi B's got to become Muslim. We see. <laughs> Making a snowman, is it permissible for kids? Yes, it is. Kids may make snowmen. Even an, an, an adult, because that's not something that could ever survive or will. But an adult, yeah, they wouldn't do that, but it, they can help their kid make a snowman. That must be that. Because kids are allowed to play with statues. Yusuf says, how to explain to people who raise question on that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will forget stuff such as Quranic verses. Retake your shahada. Because 
the Prophet Sallallahu part of prophethood or prophecy is, and messengership is that they are uh, capable of perfect tabliq. Otherwise, Allah would have chosen the wrong prophet. As-sidq wal-amana wal-tabliq wal-fatana. Four conditions. By necessity, they must be the most intelligent class of people. They must be honest in what they say. Their past track record is always honest. In sidq and amana is when you're given a trust, you keep it. The fourth thing is that the ability to transmit the message. So there's, why would anyone say they forgot verses? If the Prophet lost something, for example, or forgot something of the dunya, that is not anything to do with of the deen. Okay. Didi says, you mentioned in a previous live that there is no marital rape since consent is at nikah. As a term, as a term, but there could be abuse, of course. Let's say a woman says, oh, I'm a bit tired. And he just jams himself, right? Forces himself. That's, we could say, other. It's harm, right? You harmed her. Okay? But it, it won't be considered rape because rape is when there is no consent and you force yourself. And it's zina. So you owe her a dowry, the going rate of a dowry, and you get lashed. And if he was a married man, killed. Because had to zina. Okay? And the requirement is not for witnesses to witness rape. No. If she, if secondary evidence is enough, like she runs right away and accuses him of rape and someone eyewitnesses it, okay? That, that, she, she, that she did it right away. Not eyewitnesses the rape. I witnessed that she went right away. There was distress followed by pregnancy. So you showed distress, you showed pregnancy. Okay. Um, or there's bruises. And so there is distress, you immediately went, and you have bruises. Now, what is not allowed? No distress. You didn't go right away. And then you came months later and said, This pregnancy is as a result of rape. Or I have no evidence, but I was raped months ago. That's not going to be accepted. Okay. What age does youth end? 40. What about the hadith of the angels cursing a woman? Yes, the hadith, the angels curse the woman who is banning uh, or disallowing the man to come near her after having agreed. And that's not because she's tired. She just not, doesn't want to. She's using it against him. But you have agreed. You got married. So that's against the purpose of marriage. One more question, unfortunately. Samuel Muzamdar. I saw one guy I don't like Sheikh Yaqubi for having guys and girls in Nasheed. Hmm. That's a comment. All right. Please like the stream for us and... Um, you can make it so, give you notifications so that you can know as soon as we're streaming again. Um, and the last question is: What are the the kufr, What is the uh, the types of kufr refuted in Surah Al-Ikhlas? The first type of kufr refuted is that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is composed of parts, because He says, "Qulu Allahu Ahad." He is one in himself. That means his attributes are not divisible. Okay. Allahu Samad. He ha he possesses al ghina al mutlaq. Absolute independence. That means he would not be dependent upon anything. Time, space, materiality, the laws of cause and effect. He does not depend upon anything. Lam yalid wa lam yulad, he's transcendent beyond time and has no offspring does not produce an offspring, nor 
was produced by an antecedent. So that means he is com- existent infinitely by necessity. Okay, and it's transcendent beyond time. And and there is nothing like unto him. So the attributes of created beings, he is transcendent beyond that. Created beings are on a timeline. They have a beginning. They have an end. They are in need of cause and effect, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Those are the kufrs. Qasim is asking from Instagram this uh, about the stream. Yes, this stream is public. And this stream is every day at 1 o'clock. Today there was a traffic problem, uh, a parking problem. So that's why it's at one thirty. But otherwise, we come at one thirty. What's the question by Amrabit? Al-Murabit says, um, can you ask, can my question be sent onto your account? Yes, you can. So tomorrow, inshallah, I guess. Well, what was your question? I sent you the only account. Oh, okay, okay. So we'll check that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, ArcView today, we have a class for the Britishers. And that is going to be at 4 o'clock, 9 o'clock GMT, ArcView Plus class on Imam and Nawi Sharh of Muslim. That's coming up right now. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika na shadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa aminu al-salihat. Wa tawasu bil-haq. Wa tawasu bil-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.